Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Rick to the Con video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be starting things out with an update to the Nintendo Switch hardware refresh story that we ran a few days ago. As further evidence has come to light and tells us that we may actually see an entire new PCB along with 8 gigabytes of memory, which is quite the upgrade from the current models of Switch, which has just 4 gigabytes. Then we're going to move over to the Linux, as the company has unveiled their adaptive compute acceleration platform, which claims to offer immense adaptability and delivers levels of performance and energy efficiency which is quote unmatched by either cpus or gpus then we shall move over to ray tracing because both amd and microsoft reveals their part in the future of computer graphics and then we're going to finish the video with perhaps the ps de resistance and that would be intel's eight core coffee lake that's right it has actually been spotted in the wild but we're going to begin as i said with nintendo switch so a few days ago, there were multiple reports regarding the Switch 5.0 firmware. Now this upgrade referenced a new SOC known as Mariko. In video, by the way, uh, internally call it the T214. And many, including myself, I will admit, speculated that the main purpose of this was to allow Nintendo to circumvent the piracy and backup solutions which were in place for the system. In short, the fact that the system had an off-the-shelf Tegra part allowed them to utilize features which NVIDIA's own engineers and developers had implemented and thus were able to gain deep level access to some of the functionality of the chips. You could not simply patch this with like an up so a software update. And obviously Nintendo have a very dim view, to put it mildly, of piracy. A chap by the name of Mike Heskin, who is a vulnerability researcher, reverse engineer, and InfoSec enthusiast, has, however, discovered evidence that there is not only a new PCB and, of course, a new SOC, once again, the T214, also known as Mariko, but also 8 gigabytes of memory. He did also emphasize that its quote, has a custom Nintendo boot ROM, new key materials, new PMIC, and a new PCB. However, from the outside, it will look identical. At the moment, there's not enough information for us to call it one way or another. And from what we're understanding, the fact that the chip on the outside looks essentially identical, it's very difficult to call whether we're going to see any improvements in clock speed. Now, at the end of the day, if this is an identical Tegra variant, I don't think Nintendo are going to be able to squeeze that much more out of the GPU or CPU clocks, and I don't think it's got, let's just say, an, another additional set of stream processors. I guess technically it would be CUDA cores. So the inclusion of an extra 4 gigabytes of memory is rather baffling. If one was to take a look at, let's say, for the sake of argument, Doom, quite often you can say that the game is actually CPU bound, which makes sense. I mean, it is essentially a port from systems which have considerably more CPU and GPU resources. As usual, we'll keep you apprised on this. Now let's move over to the Linux and Project Everest, also known as an ACAP, A-C-A-P, Adaptive Compute Acceleration Platform. I'm going to begin by reading a quote from Victor Peng, who is the president and CEO of Zilinux. This is a major technology disruption for the industry and a most significant engineering accomplishment since the invention of the FPGA. This revolutionary new architecture is part of a broader strategy that moves the company beyond FPGAs and supporting only hardware developers. The adoption of an ACAP product and the data center as well as our broad markets will accelerate the pervasive use of adaptive computing making the intelligent connected and adaptable world a reality sooner so the a camp at its core is a new generation of fpga fabric so what we have here is hardware and memory distribution distribution on steroids that means you've got hardware programmable dsp blocks a multi-core sock and is essentially the next evolution in fpga Typically, an FPGA is, well, pretty much a coprocessor. You can almost think of it like a GPU. With Project Everest, that's not the case. Instead, what we have here is almost like adding a third type of processor into the mix. 
As for its usage, well, it's pretty varied. Video transcoding, database, data compression, search, AI inference, uh, genomics, machine vision, storage and hardware acceleration, sorry, network acceleration. Rather amusingly, Linux are also calling this computing after Moore's law. I say amusingly because, of course, Moore himself was instrumental in the foundation of Intel, but Moore's law has also been something that Intel have clung to. Yet we all know Intel struggles currently with 14NM. In fact, it's been there for four generations now. The company do look to have finally started to perfect 10NM, but one can argue that they're certainly behind schedule. Project Everest, just for your FYI, is built on 7NM. So what about performance? Well, obviously these are their internal benchmarks, not my own. But according to Linux, they believe that Adaptive Computing Acceleration Platform can do workloads between 10 and 100 times faster compared to a CPU. And compared to its own last generation, you can see AI compute capacity increased by about 20 times, with bandwidth with 5G being increased by four times. The final silicon will be taped out uh, by this year, and first shipments to customers are going to be expected next year. Next up, ray tracing. So the first we heard about ray tracing, of course, was from the leak regarding Volta being the architecture of choice when it came to ray tracing on NVIDIA and the RTX technology. So we have a two-part follow-up to this, one from AMD, the second one from Microsoft. Regarding AMD, we see that they've announced real-time ray tracing for the Radeon Pro render, and this has also been shown as well in the Radeon GPU profiler. But according to AMD, they are still going to be making a series of updates over the next several days, so we'll learn more information on that. But Microsoft have also decided to throw its hat into the ring. Well, to be fair, Microsoft are instrumental to the creation of this. Now, think of this. DirectX 12, for all intents and purposes, is four years old now. I mean, we first started to hear about it back at GDC 2014, and then about a year later on, it came into Windows 10, and of course, games like Ashes of the Singularity and other titles were among some of the first to support this. So, for better or worse, developers are now starting to get their, their minds around how DirectX 12 and other low-level appies work and function. So, to that end, DirectX Ray Tracing is an extension to DirectX 12 graphics API. And this brings, of course, a couple of things into the mix. The first is because it's DirectX 12, we have standardization. As we've discussed multiple times on the channel, including from interviews and so on, standards are very, 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 very important. If everyone is essentially communicating in a different language, which is basically different standards, it's not great for us as customers, and it's even suckier for games developers. Because obviously, at the end of the day, it's just a nightmare. But if you have an appy, a common language, where you can simply you know, write your game engine or whatever, and Appy does most of the translation work, then that's great for us. The second thing is that DXR is going to tightly integrate with standard and traditional levels of rasterization. This means developers can simply intermix the two depending on what technique is best for the scene and or levels of performance and effects. So there is a couple of things for us to note. And by the way, I will be doing a much more in-depth video on ray tracing when AMD releases their information. I'm waiting for that. I was actually going to do it today, uh, but when I saw that you know Microsoft have released this information and then, of course, AMD are kind of sitting on the fence for their information, I figured it's better to wait so I can essentially put everything into one video. I figure that's the better way of doing it. But I do want to give you guys at least some indication on some of the information we have. So already GPUs are technically capable of running ray tracing and it would do so through the generic shaders in other words the CUDA units or let's say the stream processors whether it's NVIDIA or AMD but there's a couple of issues with that and performance may not be the best way of doing things so instead uh, all of the companies involved have decided that specialized GPU hardware would be the best way to go so where Microsoft come into this, of course, is to help to create the standards and to write the appy itself. 
They're not dictating how the hardware on the GPU functions, more to give a vague set of variables on how the actual acceleration will work. So of course, essentially we're gonna have a couple of different ways of doing this. The first would be if you have a Volta-based GPU or however it's gonna work with AMD, we're still a bit unsure about that at the moment. In which case, they would have hardware acceleration specifically for ray tracing. From what I can tell, that's going to be via tensor cores and Volta, which is somewhat interesting. And I'm going to be curious to see what the split is regarding the number of CUDA cores. Just for your FYI, Titan V comprises 5120 CUDA cores, whereas the Titan XP contains 3840. And a very simplified way to think of what a tensor core is, is they're essentially great at multiplying. They use half precision FP16 maths, and then they will be able to calculate things. So essentially these things are just really, really good at doing operations. Um, and just a very slight FYI, this is actually something coincidentally that I discussed very in depth with Neil Trevitt in a second part of an interview where I discussed deep learning and lots of other stuff. That part of an interview is actually something I'm working on at the moment and it will be up on the channel over the next few days. Uh, I am in an awful rush at the moment. I have one week before I go to the United States, just for your FYI. Of course, there are a couple of questions you've probably got. The first is what the hell is the performance levels gonna be like with software support? In other words, if you were to, let's say, have a GTX 1080 or even a 1080 Ti, and a game was to say run with ray tracing or you could disable ray tracing, what's the performance impact? Is it gonna be marginal? So for example, five or 10% performance? Is it gonna be 50% or are we gonna see the difference here between, let's say, I'm just using the example, but a GTX 2080, which we'll presume is what Volta is gonna be called, would get, let's say, 100 frames a second in a game at 1080p. I'm obviously just using an example here. Uh, a GTX 1080 would get 50 frames a second, but if you enable ray tracing, Volta would go down to, let's say, 80 frames a second. But with the 1080 then tank, rather than, let's say, for, from 50 to 40, instead it would tank because there's no specialized hardware to handle ray tracing, would it tank to, let's say, 15 frames a second or 20 frames a second? Unfortunately, I don't know that yet, and fr quite frankly, I don't think anyone outside of NVIDIA and a few select software studio knows this. The other question, and this one's pretty obvious as well, is what the balls is happening with DirectX 12, DXR, and the Xbox One? I mean, technically, the 8th generation consoles, it's not very difficult to figure out that one of the reasons, one of the, the, one of the things that propelled DirectX 12 was the Xbox One. I mean, surely it's not the only thing, but that level of standardization of, okay, if you write for a console, you've got something that can be easily transposed to a PC. Well, you know, you can just go doink. Obviously somewhat simplifying things here. So Microsoft have not formally announced DXR for the Xbox One. If I had to guess, it's probably because there's just not enough performance there. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's going to be rather interesting. And I know that that word's overused, but it's going to be very interesting to see how this functions. I mean, this is me purely speaking out my ass because ultimately I don't know what Microsoft are planning for the future. It's possible we might just have a streaming service, but it's also possible that ray tracing could form to be, I don't know, part of Microsoft's long-term strategy for the Xbox division. Perhaps they're going to, for the next Xbox, have for lack of a better term, hardware accelerators specifically designed for ray tracing. After all, the Xbox One, especially the the basic model console, just would not be able to handle ray tracing, at least in theory. The Xbox One X might, but once again, it depends on the impact on the, you know, just not having dedicated hardware in there. Or perhaps it does. Maybe Microsoft can get another one of the parts of the GPU or the SOC to do something. We just don't really know yet. It's going to be really curious, though. And finally, an update to the Z390 and 8-core CPU fiasco. And yes, I'm going to call this a fiasco because we have finally confirmation that this bloody thing exists. 16 cores, 8... Uh, sorry, 16 threads, 8 cores. That sounds better, doesn't it? 
if it was 16 cores and 32 threads, I think you and I would probably be having a very different conversation of like, oh my god, what the hell, barbecue. Instead, it's 8 cores, 16 threads, and it's running at 2208 megahertz. So there's a couple of theories here. The first one is that, well, basically, 3D Mark not so much reading the clock speeds correctly. The second possibility is that it's just simply reading the stop clock, and that's about it. So there's a couple of theories that immediately one can... Uh, make. The first is that Intel are definitely reading, uh, sorry, jumping into the core war with AMD. After all, yeah, the 8700K was the first processor from Intel for the desktop mainstream, which was six cores. The second is that now we have confirmation this thing actually exists. It's going to be very curious to know how this fits into their overall roadmap. While many are immediately jumping onto the bandwagon of, well, this is part of the eighth generation of Intel processors. Technically, there's nothing here which tells us that. I mean, technically, from a very generic point of view, this could also be ninth core as well. I mean, we just don't really know yet. There's no, there's no like, evidence one way or the other. All we have is under the motherboard, there's an Intel Coffee Lake S82 UDIM RVP, which is basically an engineering board. The last thing I'd like to leave you with, and forget even competing against uh, AMD, because I feel that this is going to be quite an expensive part. I don't know that for a fact. I mean, for all that I know, they could sell this thing for $1.50, or you could get it free with, like, you know, a bag of pretzels. But I'm going to assume that this is going to be more expensive than an AMD 8-core part. What I find rather well, let's just say it's going to be bizarre, is how Intel are going to square this regarding its HEDT roadmap. Now, yes, of course, the X299 does certainly have some things which it has over the mainstream. For example, it has quad-channel memory and blah, blah, blah. But let's put it this way. I don't feel that for a lot of folks, they're going to care. I mean... I will also cite overclockability and final clock speeds as well, but let's just say for the sake of argument, the i9-7900X, which has 10 cores, 20 threads, and the 7820X, of course, has 8 cores, 16 threads. Now, the main difference between those is the clock speed, which uh, they run at 4.5 gigahertz. but let's, for the sake of argument, say that this 8-core processor runs at a similar clock speed to the 8700K. Now, the 8700K max turbo frequency is 4.7 GHz, so that's around 200 MHz positive. Now, overclocking, in theory, the 8700K generally does a little better. So, for a lot of individuals, I'm not saying for every individual, but for a lot of individuals, you could say, well, gee, I can spend like a thousand bucks on a 7900X, or 600 bucks on a 7820X, or I could just pick up whatever one of these is, and yes, I'm going to be losing some threads and whatever, but hey, I'm going to be saving an awful lot of money. Uh, basically, I guess my point is that even if you say the 7900X is relatively safe, and certainly the 7920X, or the equivalent for the, for the next one, which is of course known as Cascade Lake, it also pretty much nukes at least three or four of the SKUs. I mean, well actually, it nukes at least four or five of the SKUs. The i5 7640X, the 7740X, the 7800X, the 7820X, they're pretty much at this point useless. And by which I mean, you know, if you've bought one, it's not like it's suddenly going to stop working. But it also pretty much means that, well, you can just get performance cheaper. Because the Z390 motherboard, in theory at least, is going to be considerably cheaper. And with the Ryzen's previously versus this, yeah, you had the argument of, well, you know, the clock speed advantage and IPC and blah, blah, blah. So how Intel manages to compete with itself and whether we're going to see some of the lower end skews, I guess what I'm getting at, with the Cascade Lake. So, for example, that would be the equivalent of like the 7800X just being nuked and instead they're just going to have the higher end skews, which would presumably be like 8 cores minimum up to, let's say, 18 or whatever Cascade Lake has. I feel that that's much more likely. With all of that said, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.